Welcome everybody. This is CB Live and you are invited to hear John Baldoni, who is an extraordinary person, a voracious reader and has a photographic memory for whatever he reads. But first, let me tell you that this is being brought to you by the Association of Corporate Executive Coaches, of which John is a member. And not only is he a member, he's certified through us as a master corporate executive coach. So we are so delighted to have him represent ACEC and to talk to us about all the amazing things he's done and to answer the question of what are the challenges he's seeing out there for those in the C-suite? So John, welcome. Oh, thank you, CB. It's a pleasure to be on the show, and I'm honored by the invitation. So, thank you. And and I must confess, in transparency, John is one of my biggest supporters. So, Big time. so. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll just be straight up. I mean, I say this all the time. Um, CB always likes to say you have a uh, marketing background. Well, and I've said this before. Your background is front and center because you're such a creative person. And I was reinventing my business proposition when I <clears throat> when COVID struck. And so we moved everything to virtual. And CB said, let me see your website. So we went on there and she goes, just what are you selling? <laughs> and I told her and she goes, well, that's not what your website says. So I made some adjustments and, and did them pretty quickly and um, it's been onward and upward. So I love her energy and your um, ability to cut to the quick. Uh, you ask good questions and you, uh, you, you get to the heart of the matter um, very in short order. So that's Thank a valuable thing. <laughs> Thank you, John. <laughs> oh, so, okay, now that you've caused me to blush, <laughs> I love you, it. You can send the check at you know afterwards. I'll take credit card too. So <laughs> you got it, my dear. So, John, tell us a little bit about yourself. Why are you uniquely qualified to answer the questions I'm going to ask you? Well, because I've spent a lot of time in the C-suite, actually in two different iterations. Um, I began my career not dissimilar to you, um, CB, because I was in marketing communications and I did the big shows and meetings and things that corporate events that clients do. And through that, I became a corporate speech writer and I worked for people at the very top of the house. So I was in the C-suite well before I ever deserved to be there. <laughs> and so, but what it was great great training because I got to see um, leadership up close and I got to see what worked and what didn't work. And I was encouraged to write or asked to write speeches on leadership. And I rewrite these things and I go, you know, I'd rather be saying them myself. So I went back to school. I got a master's in uh, consulting and um, became um, and then eventually started writing and continuum and then be, was invited by all people uh, as our friend Marshall Goldsmith to become a coach. And I did become a coach um, and uh, went through all kinds of training programs and things. And uh, so I so actually I've been in the C-suite twice, if you will. So. Mm -hmm. So not only that, you have produced written 17 books? Oh, uh, actually 14 books um, and, I don't know, 800 columns for Harvard Business Review, Forbes, places like that. I also do a video series and then my new um, ex exciting venture is a LinkedIn live show, uh, which you are going to be on very shortly. So You know, I was going to try to weave that in, but you jumped in. <laughs> well, we Tell can say it twice. So. <laughs> Tell us about your LinkedIn live show. It's called Grace Under Pressure, which if you look at it from a marketing standpoint, and I wonder who gave me that name, Grace Under Pressure. <laughs> that We were talking about Grace because my last book is called Grace, A Leader's Guide to a Better Us. And the book came out last year. And um, we were talking about how applicable Grace is to our times of crisis and our times of discord. So we were talking and I said, I need some kind of muscle behind this and a way, a kind of a hook. And, and you said, grace under pressure and bingo. So I labeled my site that I've been doing a series of videos, very just selfie videos about issues that 
leaders need to address or things on their mind like dislocation, fear, uh, connection, um, inspiration, uh, compassion, a lot of host of issues like that. And then writing articles for Forbes and for Smart Brief on the organizational impact of our crisis and what we need to do. The LinkedIn Live show is an extension of that. I'm talking to thought leaders and doers um, who are making a difference by challenging us to think and applying their practices to helping leaders get through this crisis. And we have interesting conversations about um, the, what leaders need to do and how we can come together more connectedly and more compassionately for one another. So I'm going to put you on the spot and I didn't tell you I was going to do this. So hold on to your seat. So recently I was in a group um, meeting of advertising and marketing folks. And for two weeks, we discussed the whole Black Lives Matter issue. And the name of the program is Action Chat. And so the discussion was pretty raw, pretty intense about what people could do, how they were feeling in the marketing and advertising space. The following week, which was three weeks, three weeks later, you were introduced in your book about grace. There was some unrest amongst those that were black about what was the subtle message. Is he trying to tell us that I'll fight for equality should be more graceful. And so I'd like for you to address, how do you tie grace into a fight long-term, hundreds of years struggle for equality? Well, grace is that gift that is given to us that we give back, okay? Grace is, we often think of it uh, rooted to faith-based traditions, and actually it's in, inherent in every faith, but uh, you've heard me speak this before, it's inherent in our DNA. Um, grace is our generosity, our respect, and our compassion. Respect is the lever in, in social, uh, on, uh, social injustice because um, it, uh, minorities, blacks, have not been treated respectfully. Um, and they, um, and so they have been um, ostracized or uh, marginalized or whatever, uh, held apart from the mainstream, opportunities withheld. Um, there's nothing graceful in that. People who have, uh, who have perpetrated that marginalization are acting without grace so often. Um, and this is definitely from a faith-based tradition. Certainly in the African-American church, uh, there has been great grace shown to, um, toward violence perpetrated to them. And, that, and I think that maybe has led to, well, the victim has to say, I'm sorry first. And, and what world are we living that? There's a room, um, uh, there, there is a, uh, um, 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 I'm sorry, there is certainly a place for righteous anger, which is due to being mistreated. It's what you do with that anger that matters. And that's why someone like John Lewis, whom we just lost to a couple of weeks ago, was such a powerful example because he was beaten uh, more than once and always acted in a true spirit of, um, of healing. The other example like that and um, is Nelson Mandela. And what people don't understand so much about Mandela because he's been deified uh, is that Mandela was in his tribe was a chief. And so he had a sense of presence and he was a natural, quote, natural born leader, if we want to say that. So when he was an ANC, um, uh, African National Congress fighting for racial justice, and then he was imprisoned on Robben Island for 27 years, Something happened in prison, um, and he was on a, um, a slow release program. So he was let out by the apartheid government and then had a little house. And in this little house, he was able to and, um, literally invite people to visit him. And often it was his nominal oppressors. 
And in there, he always insisted on serving them tea. That was a way of him being in charge. The thing about Mandela that is often sublimated, that he was, con he was rightly so, felt so wrong. 27 years have been taken from his life. And he was very bitter about it, but he found a way to act for the greater good. How he did it, I, he acted with grace. That's what he did. So it wasn't that um, he didn't, uh, he sublimated his anger and turned it into you know, a righteous cause. That's up to individuals how they process it. I don't think grace should never be an excuse for rolling over and, and playing, uh, being, uh, being a patsy. That's not what grace is because as I look at grace too, and the, uh, I talk about it being action and energy, uh, people are motivated to make righteous change. Um, and Mandela would fall into that. John Lewis certainly would. Um, and so, um, but inherent in, in grace are the two attributes that are sometimes in short supply in our culture. And that's mercy and forgiveness. You know, we're kind of in a, a gotcha culture. When people screw up, we want to pile on. And where's the mercy there? And where is the forgiveness? And what we know from forgiveness is that forgiveness begins within ourselves when we have that capacity, but it's an unburdening of ourselves. And so that we free up. And, and I, uh, I, I can't talk about this on big, serious issues. I mean, um, but you know, when we, we feel wronged by a colleague or, you know, um, mistreated or something, if we don't forgive that person in our own mind, we're just carrying that animus around with it and it weights us down and it eats up our energy. You know, if we act with grace, if we act with forgiveness, we'll just say, okay, don't, doesn't necessarily mean you forget and you may not want to do business with that person again, but um, you free yourself to show grace on yourself, if you will. So well, that's, an answer. <laughs> it's a complicated um, position, let's say, because on one hand, you're saying, from what I understand, is that by showing grace, we could almost be energized to move on with our lives. Um, I don't know, yeah. energized, a free, a freed up. I, we unburden ourselves. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, I, I would dare say that it's, you know, asking black people to forgive white people for their sins and injustices is a whole lot to ask. And then you have to ask yourself, if the situation were reverse, what would be the reaction? Oh, I'm not asking uh, black people to forgive, to forgive white people. No, not at all. I'm talking about it in, um, and then I just said, there's a reason for righteous anger because without righteous action and, and, and motivation, which is heated at times, there would be no change. You know, um, the civil rights movement of the fifties, while it was, you know, uh, we thought we frame it through the, the nonviolent protests. And it was, um, though that came out of three centuries of degradation and, and mistreatment and rage and pain and suffering, which we, as a white person, I have no idea. I cognitively, I can say I can describe it, but I have no idea what it means to be marginalized. I, I none. So, um, but, and so, no, I'm not asking anybody to roll over. And grace would give one that ability to do so, but that's a personal choice. And to do so doesn't, doesn't mean that you lay down the cause and say, well, you just do whatever you want and we'll take what we get. And that's not what we, that's not what Martin Luther King preached. I mean, you know, and um, because, you know, he was he was possessed of a righteous indignation that he channeled into his act actions. Um, but he wasn't a pushover. I mean, and ultimately he gave his life. I mean, what what greater sacrifice could there possibly have been? You know, I'm glad that you explained that because I think that many people listening would have taken it the other way. And so I wanted you to have this opportunity to 
further express the whole the multi dimensions of grace. Well, thank and you. That one could consider it in all the dialogue that's going on. It, one could consider it as a another methodology in dialogue. Showing grace. Oh yeah, because grace is what facilitates kindness towards others. Grace, I think, at its, at its core is about connection. Um, it's about reaching out to others and connecting them. Here's the interesting point, and this is what I learned from Father Boyle, uh, Father Greg Boyle, who uh, runs the Homeboy Industries in Los Angeles. It's, all, it's connecting with people in, in a way that they want to be connected to. If I go into a disadvantaged community and start preaching about you people need to do this and you people need to do that, there might be some sound advice on, on that, but I'm not connecting with anybody. I'm lecturing. And so beginning, you have to just sit or occupy space with someone uh, and understand them. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's what Stephen Covey used to say, seek to understand before you are understood. And so often in our world, we are so much in a hurry, and I raise my hand, um, that we don't have, quote, time to understand. We think we do. I think I understand you, CB, but let me tell you how it is. <laughs> so, yeah. Yes, have I heard that a lot. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and it's off in another plane. <laughs> Well, what we, yes, and what happens is that's a missed opportunity. There is no connection. And it happens, too, to well-intended people. You know, um, it's not that we go into, you know, um, try, to, you know, uh, we ex someone of, of good intention uh, expends good effort, but they're just, it's like two ships passing in the night, and that's a lost opportunity. Um, and so that's why... We all need re-education, if you will. We all need, and part of it just comes down to patience and listening, you know, and two of the hardest things that, uh, for me, or I can listen pretty well, but I'm not the most patient person. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting that the story, I mean, it's sort of taken us a little bit off uh, our goal for today, but it's an interesting discussion because I remember in the same group when we first broke up, you weren't part of the group at that point. We first started discussing Black Lives Matter and we were broken up into small pods to discuss it. And I was in with, I think it was four or five white men. And the first thing they said to me, oh, CB, I feel so bad for what you've gone through. I'm just, uh, I am besieged with upset. I didn't see it coming. I didn't know these things were happening. And I, Time out, you don't know what I've gone through. You know, I appreciate the concern, but first you need to ask what I've experienced so that it becomes a real connection mm -hmm. for us to, and a real starting point. I know their hearts were in the right place, but the message start first from ground zero and then build up towards solution action. Right. So I know exactly what you're saying. Let's just take a moment and listen first. So, John, good book. Um, you know, you have written some amazing books and always on target and on point. So thank you for that. And I see you have a sign in the back of you. What is that about? Uh, that's from one of my first books, 180 Ways to Walk the Leadership Talk. It's a little book, and it's just a, a collection of uh, positive behaviors that leaders can express to others. I did it through a publishing company, which is still around, called Walk the Talk. And uh, I think that book has sold, I don't know, 80,000 copies or something. Oh, so it's I certainly my mega seller. So, uh, wow. So could you give us a couple of examples? <laughs> I knew I was hoping you would. I tell you what I did do is I did turn lead into an acronym and it was learn, energize, act, demonstrate. Uh, I think another E, engage. And re and I think R was respect. So uh, all the behaviors were grouped under those those type things. Just Brilliant. grab Brilliant. and go 181 little 180 little to do things. So. Well, okay, so that leads us into our conversation today is 
And that is, what do you see are the top three challenges that people in the C-suite face? Are they behavioral based or other based? Well, I think uh, let's put, it's a good question and let's put a caveat on it. I think uh, let's put aside the financial uh, challenges, okay? okay? Because that's always, if you're going to run your business, that's paramount. And so, Or if you're in an organization, your viability has to be that. So aside from financial challenges, either growing business or lean business or whatever's happening, or you're a social service agency and you're faced with budget challenges and resources and all that. Aside from that, I think there's three things. Uh, challenge about trust, um, challenge about developing your people, and how do you deal with the unknown? You know, those are three challenges um, that I see or I perceive that folks need to deal with. So. Okay, so let's take one at a time. And you know what, if we run out of time, let's come back because I want to really dive into this. So first one, trust, trust. We hear that all the time. You know, and, and yet we don't hear it enough. No, I, I'm a big believer in Stephen M. R. Covey's book, Trust, The Speed of Trust. Uh, I have used that book as a reference. And I, what I love about it, is there are 11 chapters in there about action behaviors to do. And um, uh, so I'm going to say that is a great resource. But what the first thing you do, and uh, Stephen uh, MR does this the same that way, is focus on behaviors. Are you uh, walking to talk, which was the title of that book, 180 Ways to Walk to Talk. That's amazing. And yeah, easy to say. And if you ask any leader, uh, CB, are you walking the talk? You would say, I would might even be take a front. Well, how could you ask me that? You know, but are we? <laughs> are it's we? It's a challenge. Um, it's a challenge yeah. every day. It's not and, it's not that easy. And it, you know, and as you well know, because you run an organization and you coach leaders and you shepherd um, uh, all us coaches, uh, it starts with accountability. If you don't hold yourself accountable, there ain't going to be no trust, no way, no how. And that's why we see in organizations such a bifurcation between frontline management or management employees and senior levels, because guess who gets the big package and guess who doesn't? Um, curiously, in our time of pandemic, at least initially, there have been um, higher levels of trust. People are looking to their leaders or executives and they are believing them. And so there are higher levels of trust. So leaders are doing something right. OK, so the challenge is to keep that going. All right. But it starts with accountability. And OK, let's break it down. Yep. Higher levels of trust, meaning that they're trusting their leaders more if they are why. And so what's making the shift? I think they see that their leaders are doing the best for them to keep the organization going. I think that when it's a higher level of trust, they're seeing their leaders, they're more visible because they're um, using technology. Um, what I advise leaders to do and whether they do it or not is to connect informally so and uh, you know you talk about the business but stay in touch with your people and also here's the thing listen for what you're not hearing um if someone who's generally up um you know up upbeat and all of a sudden is showing lack of uh, energy or enthusiasm and it's not just one day check in on that person is he or she having a problem with the child or is is there an elder care situation or is that person isolated due to covid and can't connect with anybody physically you know all of those things so that's a challenge right there so. but john you know here's a reality check i totally agree with you but if you're talking the ceo of ford how do you get in touch and how do you stay in touch and how do you reach well, you do. That's a very appropriate question. And you do it within your appropriate level. Um, I'm not asking the CEO of a manufacturing company to um, text uh, frontline workers. But the challenge is that every level of management stays in touch with his or her workers. 
That's what I'm saying. So setting the example. Okay. Setting the example. And that's what, you know, I, re I remember writing about um, a head of a, a healthcare system who she, had, she said she had an open door policy. Um, she had thousands of workers, employees, and she had an open door policy. Literally anybody could go in and talk to her. And she was, and Nancy made herself accessible. And I said, how's that working out? And she goes, it works very well. But what she meant was, if Nancy's doing it, then Bill, the CFO, and Charlie, the uh, controller, and Jennifer, the head of HR, are, ex are doing the same thing. Why? It's expected. It's example. Uh, Nancy's holding herself accountable. Why aren't the others? It so setting the table for others to do the same. Let's talk about this word accountable. What does that mean for you? It means do what you say you're going to do and follow through. And 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 here's the big thing about it: um, we are we are frail creatures. We make mistakes. We screw up. Admit them. Um, and and not just and apologize when appropriate, but make amends. And so if I if I'm your boss, CE CD, and I cut you off in a meeting or I'm not acting, you know, and I'm just sort of nasty to you or whatever, A, I should apologize. And then my amends are going to be at minimum, I'm going to say at our next meeting, you know, I was, I took it out on CB uh, the other day and I, I was out of line um, and leave it at that, you know, um, making amends. If you've done something wrong, then write the wrong, whatever that means, you know. You know, uh, one of our colleagues in ACEC just put out a great book related to this called Saving Face. Oh, Maya Hushan. Yes, yeah. yes. And my question for her, and she, she gave a great answer, is why are so many leaders afraid to do this? Why are they so afraid that being accountable means showing weakness? It's just the opposite. It's just the opposite. And but why do they think that way? A, a protection because they're not, they don't have a deep enough understanding of what leadership means. Um, and, um, and in a management culture, and we all need strong management cultures because a management culture is the administration of things. And that's how things get done. Um, there's not a lot of forgiveness. The forgiveness comes from the leadership quotient. So, and us also part of it is a male thing. Men are taught, I think it's changed, but men are less emotional than women. And so if you show emotion, if you show vulnerability, um, that uh, is therefore a kind of weakness. When in reality, it's actually a sign of strength. Why? Because you have the courage to say what you've done. You have the courage to be humble. Now, accountability or humility is, doesn't have to come out of, of wrong or I mean, of making a mistake. Humility is, I like to say, it's an, an active thing. I don't have all the answers, you know, and I'm going to hire really smart people. And I don't care if they're smarter than I am. I'm the boss and I, I'm their leader. And my job is to put them in a position where they can put their smarts to good use. Now, if they're always acting too smart or smart ass, <laughs> that I'm going to have a coaching conversation with them. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> yeah, I think, um, you know, this lack of saving face I agree with you, shows such great weaknesses and it shows a lack of inner strength. If you're that afraid of appearing to be weak, then your inner strength is weak. I, I, I wouldn't, yes, I, I would say that, but I'd like to say, I wanna give them the benefit of quote, re-education. I wanna give them the ability to be coached. I wanna give them, because, if they may not know any better, and that's if you grew up in a punitive uh, management culture. And when I started in my career, that was I mean, I'm old enough to remember the dinosaur managers. 
And, you know, uh, if bad news was good, no news was good news. Yes. Everything you heard was bad news. If you grew up in that kind of system and they still exist, and a lot of them are called family owned businesses. Um, so <laughs> I give them a chance to re to be reeducated, to be coached and to say, hey, it's OK, you know, and uh, to be that. And if they don't respond from there, well, that's another issue. And so you really think they're coachable on a learn long term? That kind of person. Yeah, because I've worked with them. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. So what are some coaching tips for that type of person? Well, I think you make it you show them examples of what it means. And part of it is taking the burden off your own shoulders. It's like a people who feel that way feel they have to do everything. Yes, they delegate and all that, but they think every, the buck stops with them and it does, but they get in, they get wrapped around their own axle and they're so wrapped around their axle, their first pushback is you don't understand what it's like. Well, no, I don't know what it's like to run your company, but I talk to more um, people in your position than you have. <laughs> and, and, you know, I can give you good examples of people who do that. A, our friend, Alan Mulally, <laughs> for one, um, but show them, make it safe for them. Also show it as an opportunity for them to get better at what they do, get better results, get more out of their people and may have a better life. You know, um, you know, um, 120 hours, you know, 100, working 120 hours a week is not really healthy for anybody. So I, I like what you just said, make it safe for them, because you you definitely don't think of an aggressive um, driving boss as someone who needs a safety zone. Well, part of that, that part of that aggression and drive comes from the where they were their upbringing. And so they think that's the only way. Um, yeah. And so that way, when you challenge that, you show them, hey, there's a better way. They're always going to be driven. They're always going to be pushing hard. They're going to tend to be aggressive, but they're going to learn. You catch more bees with honey than you do with vinegar, because then you start showing them statistics. OK, what's your what's your turnover rate about yeah. direct reports? What's um, show me the engagement figures for your company. Um, how does that compare to your competitors? Um, and, you know, what do people say about you? Um, you know, and I can tell them what they say about you. <laughs> you know, they, they respect you because you're the boss, but they think you're a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it, it also goes back to in this day and age, um, people don't feel compelled to stay in an environment where they're being abused. Bingo. That's <laughs> the thing. It's a talent. You're driving your best people away. Absolutely. The people that stay are the deadwood. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there is an absolute war on talent and people think, oh, come on, it's hard to find a job. Well, it may be difficult, especially given COVID, but is it, how hard is it to find really good talent? That's a whole different vocabulary, right? It's hard. It's hard to find. It's harder to find good talent than it is for good talent to find a job. So. <laughs> I love that. I love that. So now, okay, let's talk about um, fear of the unknown. Well, I think you and I have had this conversation before. What keeps CEOs up at night is what it's not what they know. It's what they don't know. Um, am I, are my people trained? Am I prepared for, uh, my competitors doing this now in crisis, now in COVID we've had three things. We've had COVID economic collapse and social, um, unrest, uh, all three in three months. That's pretty, talk about black swan. I mean, this is the pretty amazing. Yeah. And, but here's the, here's the outro of this. 
I, I always go back to my one of my favorite um, historical figures, which is Winston Churchill. And the great thing about Churchill was that he said that he mobilized the British people, which he did do because through his oratory, he made them feel that they were part of the war effort. Mm -hmm. He mobilized them. He, he, and he said, I gave the lion the roar, but the roar came from the people that said, this for a leader, you're not gonna face any other crisis like this in your life. Make this your finest hour. So how do you deal with the unknown? Well, you, you don't. You, you accept it. And then what I like to say, and I've written about this before, it's ambiguity. Nobody likes ambiguity, you know. And um, I want you to tell me, um, CB, I have my job for as long as I want it. Well, I'd like to hear that. But you can't tell me that. And you're the boss and you're feeling stress on that. What you can do is say, I will tell you what I know as soon as I can. I will keep you in the loop. Further on that is you square the circle. What is it we can do? Can we cure the pandemic? No, but we can all wear masks. We can social, we can physically distance. We can work virtually. We can find a way to connect. We will do what we will do in the best way possible. Will we make mistakes? Oh yeah, we will, but we'll figure it out. And you know what? We're going to do it together. And that's part of it. So, you know, we're never going to, there's always going to be a curve in there. There's always going to be something that changes. And the smart leaders are those who are prepared, not for the event itself, but prepared for the crisis because A, they have a crisis plan, but they have a, in a way, maybe a crisis mentality in the sense that they know how to cope with this. You know, they've seen, they may, they haven't seen this event, but they've seen other events and we trust them and um, they bring people together, you know? Yeah. I think that you have a good point because I think the successful leaders that have come out of this, they have set up a culture of we're in this together, whatever happens, we're in this together. Doesn't even have to be a crisis. It could be a competitor, but we're gonna figure it out together. And here's the other thing. Um, I don't know what the new, nor you know, our, our colleague, Rhett Power and I do um, a series called What's Next? Uh, previews, predictions, <clears throat> prognostications. And it's about the thinkers and doers who are shaping our new normal. And we're not at our new normal, but I, and I, can you, can I tell you what our new normal is? No, but I will tell you one thing. I'm confident that those strong organizations, the values that they held in January, 2020 will be the jan will be the values they hold when they come on the other side and they will shape their new normal. So again, some, it's a cliche, but you've heard, you've heard it before, but it works. When in crisis, go to your values, your trust, integrity, belief in others, love, compassion, all of those things, those are human values. They don't change in time of crisis. And as a matter of fact, they become paramount in time of crisis. Yeah, I think we tend to mix those up with mission and strategy mm -hmm. and goals. Mm -hmm. And no, um, three different uh, things. There's yeah, all those things can go away. They can all change. Yep. Right. We tie it back as mission is our vision is our becoming mission is our doing. And that's where our strategies come from. But values, it's what ours are belonging. That's what holds us together. And that's where grace comes in. Purpose is our why, which is our vision and mission. But grace becomes our how. So in other words, I can achieve a, a vision and a mission I can do it in spite of people, but how much better is it if I bring all my colleagues along, all my team along with me? That's where grace comes in. So. Yeah, I think that there's so much confusion. I remember when I was working for, let's just say an insurance company. <laughs> an unknown, unnamed. Yeah. Unknown agency. And I remember the CEO would march the halls. He was a ex-military guy and, you know, it would be, <laughs> and you can't do this. And he would send the, the, um, the minions in to say, you can't do this, you can't do that. And you couldn't put up a picture on the wall unless it was approved, you know? 
Yeah. You couldn't put a picture on your desk unless it was approved. You couldn't eat popcorn because of the smell. And yet every year there was this company picnic where you're all supposed to come together based on common values. <laughs> What, what, what was the common value? Oppression? <laughs> you know, and everybody was, you know, bow down, bow down, you know. Yes, you know. And I thought I used to sit at these company picnics, dreading them, dreading them, saying to myself, oh God, the mixed messages, the mixed metaphors, get some consistency here. Right. And there was no such animal. And you know, that's not the only organization that does that. They think that Thanksgiving turkey, that company picnic, the Christmas party represents the whole dynamic of the organization. That's sad. <laughs> and it's so popular, so, <laughs> so prevalent in corporate America. I think we're going to, I think one thing that all the, the backswing of our new normal will be more connected. After all, we've seen our C, we've probably seen our CEO in his bathroom. If not, we've seen his wife in a bathroom. So, but seriously, we've had, we've seen kids run out, we've seen dogs, all that kind of stuff. So um, that makes us more human. And I think it leads to greater connections. And I think humility will be a little bit easier. So, uh, well, I hope so. So. I hope so. uh, it reminds me of a, a, a meeting I was on and this person was sitting at his desk with a typical, you know, polo Lacoste shirt on and perfect desk and perfect bookshelves. And he went to get up to get something that I think the, the housekeeper or the wife or somebody bought in. And you see that he was in his undershorts. <laughs> Well, that's see. That's yeah. a common denominator. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that will uh, that will cut your image down to size, and so it's how you react to that. that yeah. <laughs> I thought, well, at least they're nicely designed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, talk to me about the third area of developing people. I think when you're in the C-suite, I mean, basically, it's certainly. For, the job of a CEO is to ensure proper succession. I mean, obviously keep the organization going, but the second thing is to um, who's in line, um, not simply for my job. Marshall talks, Marshall Goldsmith talks about this a lot it, um, about not, you know, succession planning is, as he says, is putting people in boxes. What you need is um, flexible things of, of who, who has the competency, competencies to do these different things in multiple different areas. That's a development exercise. And so often what coaching to the CEO becomes coaching him or her to develop his or her team, not simply the successor, but challenge those, the CFO, the CMO, whatever their titles are. What are you doing for your people? Um, how are you developing them? Uh, what opportunities are you providing them? We call those stretch goals, I'm saying job responsibilities. That's a little bit lower down. But what are you doing um, further down the, the quote ladder? Um, are you keeping your eye on talent? And now um, I, I'm really passionate about this. I believe that crisis provokes opportunity. We've heard that a thousand times. But also, just as cream rises to the top in hot coffee, so does talent. And so you got to be watching for that talent. Who is coming? Who is making a name for himself or herself? Who's making that positive difference? Who's coming up with new ideas? Who's thinking out of the box? Who can think critically? And here's the other thing, CB. Um, this is really important. Keep your eye out, out for introverts, a competent introvert. Because yes. So, yes. so often um, it's the introverts that, I mean, how many times, how many senior leaders have you coached who are in, in, introverts? I've coached a heck of a lot of them, which are always against type because we always think, well, they're, uh, you know, outgoing and all that. They may have learned to do that, but their energy. And so at a June, at a more junior level, they haven't yet learned how to project 
but they have great minds. And the great thing about, I love about introverts is they don't have to be on stage. They're comfortable watching, listening, observing. And if they're smart, they're always processing. So what's going on in that brain? You know? I am so glad you mentioned this. Having, since I'm an introvert. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah. <laughs> Somehow I'm not sure. <laughs> oh, I am. And and I am a high level introvert too. So uh not just you but, know, not just you, what you, you don't come across that way because you have you have been in a senior leadership position and you are leading an organization yourself. And you need, you have learned how to project, how to adopt that role. My wife is the same way. My wife, if you met my wife, you would not know she's an introvert, but she is. Um, and she needs downtime to process, but she's a great listener. She's a great observer, um, you know, and um, so we need them. So what I'm saying, keep an eye on them is because when there's a lot of kerfuffle going around, they'll be lost in the shadows. So, yes. um look for that. So. Yeah, it's it's a really a good point. Did you know I was when I was studying MBTI, I found that was in one of their books that the greatest, the largest, no wait, how am I going to say this? CEOs in the United States, the greatest number are introverts. Wow, that's good to know. Yeah. And it's because we're so brilliant. You know? <laughs> well, it, we are. Now, this doesn't say every introvert is a genius or every extrovert is an idiot. <laughs> but, um, somewhere in between, there's such a thing as omniverts. People can go back and forth. So, yes. and that's actually when you learn a behavior, that's really what you're doing. You know? Yeah, um, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, so I always have fun with it because people say to me, as you just said, no. Yes, yes. I. That's why I had to change the appointments for the these interviews because people were booking them at three o'clock or four o'clock. I said, "No, got to stop." <laughs> well, you know, and that's the other point to this, CB. I'm glad you mentioned that because what you what you just gave me, gave us, gave our listeners, um, is a lesson in self management. Know what you can do and what you cannot do. Yes. Um, and managing yourself gets back to self-care. Managing yourself is the habits that you do in a day, but also it's the self-care. Are you eating right, getting enough sleep, exercise, all of those kinds of things too. Yeah. That's critically important. So anyway, two cents for that. So You know, I, I, I know that we're running out of time, but you brought up something that I think is interesting because yesterday I had a conversation with a woman who a black woman who's just put out a book about um, leadership, purposeful leadership, and she, it's addressed to black women. And her point is that black women are not trained to move up in the organization, either through their own learning or through support that they would get in an organization. And I thought about it for a long time. And I think, you know, what you're saying now in terms of training this gets me thinking because I think a lot of what you've said relates to not people of color because um, there has been no conversation, nothing written, no dialogue about what people of color, be it brown, what black or whatever, what do they need that's different in an organization to rise to the top? And I think that that's a dynamic that we haven't looked at before that's important to this workplace equality. Oh, absolutely. And uh, I mean, um, I, we all need uh, we all need guides. Um, there's a certain there's much value to be provided with a roadmap. But more than that, it's we need mentors um, and um, somebody to show us the ropes. Um, I suppose, I mean, yes, it helps if that mentor, that coach is of the same color, but it, it need not be, you know, so it, it's whoever is willing, if you are in a mentorship, whoever's willing to share and there's a match there, learn what you can from that person. And having a mentor 
you're not, it's not like being married. You can have more than one mentor. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, I think what you said, and the reason why I shook my head is this is a very tough conversation, whether or not somebody who coaches you or mentors you should be the same color. I like your add on where you said you could have more than one, because I think it's important to have a, a mentor from 360. If you're a woman, have a white male mentor. If you're a black woman, have a white and black male mentor and a white and black female mentor so that you can get total perspective from in various situations in terms of moving forward. Because having a mentor of your same race or even religion may give you a narrower framework to work in. Yes, but there is, but well, you're better equipped than I, but same race means the same experiences. And that's, that's why, but I, I take your point completely. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's why I'm saying it's good to have both sides mm -hmm. um, so that you have somebody who's experienced what right. you experienced from the same race, but then you have somebody who can, support you from a different race and give you a different lens. Absolutely. To see Absolutely. things through. Yep. So I think in developing employees as one of the things that people in the C-suite need is that they need to think in terms of, especially now, developing employees from different cultures. And it's not, yes, and but the payoff, it's not diversity, it's inclusion. Yes. It's, it's invite them, the quote them, invite people of difference, all of it, to the, to the table so that you get input from different areas. Um, and that's inclusion is the watchword. And how do we do that? And that's, that's the challenge. So, um, but we'll, we'll work on it. And that's why the social justice movement right now is so important because we're never going to change unless we become more inclusive. Um, and we have to work at it. And all of us can play a role in, in it um, in different, in, in, in our roles. And um, we do what we can. And uh, everything we do in, from a leadership standpoint should be inclusion. That doesn't necessarily mean uh, race, gender, and ethnicity inclusion, but inclusion in point of view. Um, and yeah. um, that's it. I like that. And, and now I'd like to roll back into the grace part because I think uh, inclusion requires grace. Yeah. And grace includes inclusion. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why your book is so important. Well, thank you. So, um, and I'll, I'll shout the book again, and it's, uh, I can lunch on what Alan Mulally said, because he loved the subtitle, uh, A Leader's Guide to a Better Us. And that's what yes. we're striving for right now, a better us. us. So. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Thank you so much for writing that book. And who knew it was going to be so important at this time? Because you know what? I love the various meanings of grace. Mm -hmm. And that's what I wanted to come out in this meeting, because I think, as you said, people put it in a teeny framework, when in fact, it's an explosive word that can mean so much. Well, there's another part of grace, um, which is centeredness, which comes from motion and beauty and art. And that is an enriching experience that is holistic and it simply gives us a wider, a wider lens uh, to look at. And um, that's- Tell me about that. Now you've opened up another discussion. I, I shouldn't have done that. Tell yeah. me. No, no um, I talk about, we talk about person, people who act with grace and, uh, and um, from an ad, from a, a arts or music standpoint, it's, Grace, um, the arts transport us to another world. Think of ballet. That's the motion. And so we say that's graceful. A painting, the brush strokes can be graceful or they evoke a mood, which it takes us to a, a state of grace, if you will. But then it comes back to it's an enrichment for us. It's a centering for us. 
And that's where really all grace comes from, from a centered self. If you're a, if you don't have a good sense of self, you need grace. <laughs> okay. And we all need grace because um, we're not all as centered as we think we are, but the more centered we are, the more, um, uh, understand ourselves, strengths and shortcomings, um, we can give grace. And from that, you initi initiated our friends, uh, Chester Elton and uh, um, Adrian Gostick talk about gratitude, leading with gratitude. And gratitude um, is definitely an attribute of grace. It's that giving back. But we, I say we can only give gratitude if we feel good about ourselves. And that's where we need that, and that's where grace comes into our own lives. So, yeah, I have something to give. So well said. Thank you. And, you know, I have to say this one story. Now I'm feeling very guilty <laughs> because yesterday our landscaper hired somebody to come in and spray pesticides in the back. <laughs> And he's supposed to let me know that ahead of time so I don't let my dog London out. And he didn't. Right. And I literally had a cow. <laughs> you know? And he actually had the company that he used call me up. And the, <laughs> the one thing they said to me, which really set me over the top, our product is friendly to bees. <laughs> and I said, the last time I looked, as I watched him pee, he is not a bee. Yeah, that's a good one. That's good. Uh, and I was so angry, I couldn't fit in Grace. I just thought, my poor but, little puppy is... The story is, the story is a quick reminder that we are fragile creatures, and that's what we need, Grace, to help us overcome that moment and not do it again. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm going to keep that in mind, <laughs> but I've got to tell you, it's not going to happen again because I said, that's it. <laughs> no more back pesticides. You could work on the front. You cannot touch the back anymore. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, this has been so uh, amazing. And I, I wanted to say educational, but it, that's not the right word. Uh, I, I want to say you've presented us with a different realm of possibilities and a way to look at things that may be more healthy to us internally. And the three areas that you talked about that CEOs are often concerned about, trust, developing people, and the unknown are so real and having that foundation together in an organization of values base, where we normally think about values in terms of ourselves or in terms of, you know, for example, religion. We don't think of it in terms of organizations, and it's so important. It is. It Thank is. you so much. Thank you for this opportunity. It's been fun. Thank you. So again, everyone, this has been brought to you by the Association of Corporate Executive Coaches. And gosh, you have seen an example of one of our members. So it is an amazing group of people. Thank you so much for joining us. This is CB Live.